Okay, I'm going to do something that's a little bit different. I usually have you open to a passage of Scripture. Well, you can turn to Luke chapter 8, but I'm not going to... We'll, we'll read that in a second. I'm just going to give you the title, and then I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to get into this. This is a little bit different. I say that every Sunday. So this is different from my other different. Um, I didn't even really know what to call it. Okay. But we're going to just go with it, okay? Hopefully you'll get the gist. It's kind of a little interesting study. Um, but here we go. Here's the title. Um, one time. I'm going to talk about five times in the Bible, in the Gospels, where it mentions a place that Jesus went just one time. It's kind of an interesting. There's something that they have, all of them have in common. But there it is. Let me pray, and then we'll do this, okay? Uh, Father God, I pray now that you'll bless this time right now. As we talk about uh, these particular places that you went to just once, that we see, at least, at least all we know of, that you went there one time and why you went there. Uh, God, I just pray, God, that you use it. And Lord, that you, it'll be challenging, but also, Lord, uh, comforting. Um, Lord, I'm about to... I think I'm going to... I talked last week, Lord, about the lies of the devil, and I think I'm going after one of his lies that I think... I know he uses a lot on me and probably other people as well, is that you don't care. Lord, sometimes I know I feel like we just kind of get lost in the crowd, but the truth is, Lord, you, you really, really, really love each and every one of us dearly. So God, again, we just commit this time into your hands and ask you to use it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 8. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of reading this morning. Most of what I'm going to say is just going to be Bible verses here. But let me read you some stuff. And you're familiar with most of these stories. But the first place that I'm going to mention is a place called Gadara. Okay. We know, I and mean, maybe you know where I'm going. This is a pretty familiar passage. But Luke chapter 8, verse 26, it says, They arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, okay, or Gadara, which is over against Galilee. And he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time and wear no clothes. That would be noticeable. Neither abode in any house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him with a loud voice, said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oft times it had caught him and was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he brake the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there were, and there, were there an and heard of many swine feeding on the mountain, they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them, and he suffered them. Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, and the, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. When they that fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told in the city and in the country. Then he went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They also which saw it told them by what means he that was possessed of the devils was healed. Then the whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes round about besought him to depart from them. For they were taken with great fear. And he went up into the ship and returned back again. We call this guy the maniac of Gadara. Okay, so Jesus goes to this place, Gadara, the, the place of the Gadarenes. <laughs> the children of Gad, by the way. If you remember, they were the ones that stayed on the other side of Jordan. This is where they were living. Apparently, they weren't doing the whole Jewish thing real well because they were keeping swine. Jews don't eat pigs. I'm not really sure what they were keeping them for if they weren't eating them. Now... I personally think that bacon is an evangelistic tool. <laughs> I take it often to my Jewish friends. Become a Christian. You can have bacon. <laughs> it works with the Muslims sometimes. We have bacon. <laughs> Come to the Christian side. But these guys weren't doing the Jewish thing really so well. 
But they had this guy there that was possessed with devils. Speaking of possessed with devils, Jim's here. Hey. <laughs> this guy. But it says he was, he was running around in other passages. It said he was running around screaming, cutting himself. And he was naked. <laughs> naked. And he was living in the tombs. That would be troublesome. There's a guy. You know, somebody living in Millerton or in the area that was doing this? That would be a little awkward. You try to have a cookout with your friends in the backyard, then you hear some screaming, oh no, here comes that guy again. You know, just kind of sick and weird. Apparently, they tried to stop him from time to time. It says they bound him with chains, but he would break the chains. So they were trying to like settle him down or do something. Nothing was working. Then one day Jesus showed up. He cast out all them devils. And what I'm about to say is going to be the string, the thread that's going to run through this whole message. If you look at this, and you look at the whole passage, you look at this as like, the way this played out, it was almost like Jesus went there just for that guy. You've got to remember that this is God, right? And he knows people's hearts. He knew how their response was going to be, and apparently nobody else wanted him there. Nobody else wanted him there. I mean, when, when he healed this guy... When he cast out all those devils, and then everybody came to him and said, could you just leave? That guy, that naked dude, the crazy guy, the dude that was running around cutting himself, screaming, you know, that they couldn't even chain up, that guy that they couldn't control, all of a sudden Jesus shows up and now he's clothed and in his right mind, and they look and they're scared. Okay, I get that. But it was, they're like, they told Jesus to leave. So it's almost like Jesus went there just for one guy. Just for that guy. That's pretty awesome. Number two. Where's my glasses? <laughs> Matthew chapter 15. Let me read you a little something here. Matthew chapter 15 in verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. Now, I'm doing this. This is not in chronological order. This is just another place. But he went to the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. And I've preached message on this passage before. And it's, this is, okay, here's the setup. You know, this woman comes and, and she says, She says, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter's grievously vexed with the devil. And Jesus didn't answer. She, he didn't answer her at all. Didn't say anything. Just ignored her. Well, then apparently she went to her disciples and said, Because they said, She crieth after us. She went to the disciples and said, Could you... Put in a word, could you have him speak to me? Could you have him answer my request? Could you tell him I have? And, the, so, and then now the disciples go up to Jesus. And they, they, you know, whoever it was she was talking to, and they go up to Jesus and they're talking to him. And, and she's thinking, okay, they're putting in a good word for me. What did they say? Lord, tell her to beat it, man. She's bugging us. So she's getting it not only from Jesus, she's getting the, the cold shoulder from Jesus, but now she's getting dissed by the, the disciples. And Jesus answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He said, I, she's a Gentile. I didn't come for them. I came for the house of Israel. Then, she, then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And if it, wasn't this, if it wasn't bad before, listen to what Jesus said. It's not me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. I don't know about you, but that probably would have been, I don't even know if I'd have got that far. Been like, you know, I mean, <laughs> do that today. <laughs> you know, let Jesus do that today. See how people respond to that. You know, of course, in that day, I'm pretty sure that, a lot, you know, and Jesus knew, he, but he knew her heart. Look what she says. She goes, you're right. Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Wow. 
Then Jesus answered and said to her, I can just see, I can just see Jesus looking kind of sternly maybe at her and then her that answer. This is where he was going. I mean, he knew how she was going to respond and he was, he was using her. You're like, oh, I, that's just wrong the way God was using her. Wait, we want to be used of God. Is it really up to us to choose how we're supposed to be used? God used her in a mighty way in that place as an example to her disciples because he ends up going, this is what I'm talking about, guys. It says, Jesus answered, O woman, great is thy faith. He never said that about any one of the twelve. Great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. She became an example. And God was making an example of her. Okay, so if we're not careful, I wrote this down. We often read this passage and think, wow, that was kind of mean. But we really never stop and think that he pretty much went there for her. If you read, I mean, he healed other people while he was there, but this, she's singled out right there. I mean, he, it's, there's a, we could make a real case for the fact that he went there just for her. He knew how he was going to help her, but he was also going to use her to be an example of great faith. Let's keep going. In Luke chapter 7. You said, Luke chapter 7? We were just in Luke chapter 8. Why, why didn't we go to Luke chapter 7 after we were in Luke chapter 8? Because you need to exercise your fingers, people. <laughs> I don't know why I did it this way, but here we go. Luke chapter 7, verse 11. Came to pass that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him and much people. Again, this is just the only time you ever find that he's... You find it mentioned in more than one gospel, but this is this account. Well, actually, I think this is the only time this one's. This is the only time you find this at all. It says, much people, verse 12, now when he had come nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city was with her. She had lost her husband, and now she lost her son. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. I, I love that. I love what it says, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. Can I remind you that the Lord always sees us, and the Lord has compassion on us. He knows what we're going through. Okay. He saw her when her husband died. You know. Now, you, you, you could look at this and go, well, Lord, why don't you show up and heal her son so he didn't have to die? We can't answer all those questions. We don't know. But the Lord had compassion on her, and he said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bear, and they, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying, What a great prophet is risen among us, and that God hath visited his people. <laughs> Show, I remember, you've heard me say this probably, but I remember when I first started pastoring and I'd never preached a funeral before, you know, and when my first funeral I went to preach when I was, I thought, I should probably look up, see some of the funerals in the Bible. You know, how did they preach in the, at funerals in the Bible? And I thought, man, I want to see what Jesus said. Jesus never preached a funeral that we see in the Bible. Every funeral he showed up at, he raised a person from the dead. You know, <laughs> But if you look at this, this is the only time we see that he showed up there and it was like he went there just for her. He went there just for her. He went there because he knew that this was going on and he knew what he was going to do and he went there just for her. Here's another one. I got five. We're on number four. We're going to make it, people. John chapter four. You probably already know this one. John chapter 4. The Bible says, I think in verse 3, where it says he must needs go through Samaria. Now that's not in red, if you have a red letter Bible, but it's John wrote that, and it was like that Jesus had basically, I don't know if he had said it or if it was really obvious, but he, he needed to go through Samaria. Normally a Jew wouldn't go through Samaria. They would go around because the Samaritans were half-breeds. You know, they were 
Jews that had intermarried with Gentiles, and it was just they were just kind of like set apart, set aside, and, and most Jews didn't have anything to do with it. And you can see that in the conversation, which you're going to read here in a second. But it said, no, Jesus needed to go through Samaria. And I think we're going to see why, because there was somebody that he was going to meet with. John chapter 4, beginning of verse 5, says, Then cometh he in the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, it's the only time you see that he, he went there, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus at the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Then cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto, me, or he saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. <laughs> Middle of the day. Woman coming out to draw water. Now, there's a lot of people that think, and I happen to be one of them, that when, why would she go in in the middle of the day? Most people would go in the morning. She was going when there was nobody else there. Maybe it was because of her lifestyle, and people would kind of, well, here she is, verse 9, then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me? You guys normally don't even talk to women, or especially Samaritans. Why are you which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it, who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. <laughs> the woman said, Sir, <laughs> thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus saith unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water, out of the well, shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him, shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. <laughs> the woman said, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. He basically piqued her interest. I don't think she had a clue what he was talking about, but maybe she started to get a little bit of an inclination. And then Jesus said, Call your husband and come hither. Um, uh, I, I have no husband. And Jesus said, Thou hast well said. I have no husband. He said, You're right. You have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. So in that saidst thou truly. The woman said, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And, and Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. For ye, ye worship ye know not what, but we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman says, now this is where it's good, she goes, She's, I, I know she's thinking, is this, are you? And she says, I know that the Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. And when he has come, he will tell us all things. And what Jesus says to her, he reveals something to her that he doesn't do very often. Okay, She said, I know the Messiah is coming. And then Jesus said, I that speak unto thee am he. Conversation ended right then. Well, the disciples showed up. He says, at this time, you know, upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, why, what seekest thou or why talkest thou with her? He didn't say anything. But the woman left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, come see a man who told me all things ever I did. Is not this the Christ? He got saved. What an, what an, there's so much truth in here. And God, it was like this, this whole thing right here and you know I've already brought this up but he went there he went out of his way to a place that as far as we know he only went once to meet her he must needs go through Samaria to, to, to meet her just for her just for her there's one more time one more place Jesus went once all sorts of passages, and you're familiar with it, and you might even know where I'm going with this. 
Jesus talked about it his whole time, his whole ministry. He told his disciples over and over and over. And then it come down to the end where it says he set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem. He said, it's time. And he went to Calvary. He went to the cross. He went and suffered, not for himself, but for us. He shed his blood. He went to the cross to die. And if you're not careful, you're going to miss this. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You understand, a lot of times we look at that verse, I know I do, I look at that verse for God's soul, and I put the emphasis on the world. Okay, for God so loved the world. But the world that it's talking about there, yeah, it's everybody, but don't miss the whosoever in that verse because the world is made up of a whole bunch of whosoever's. So in that sense, when Jesus went to the cross, when he went to Calvary, he went there one time. He only needed to go there one time. But he went there for you. He went there for you. He went there for me. It was like he went there just for one person. I've heard preachers say this, and it's true. If you were the only sinner on the face of the earth, Jesus would have still died for you. There's a song that we used to sing as a family. When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. I, I used to, it was hard sometimes when we get to that chorus because the chorus started with this line, he knew me, yet he loved me. He knew me. He knew everything about me. He knew every sin that I would struggle with. He knew everything that I would do in rebellion against him. He knew all of, the, my, all of my sins, my wickedness, my thoughts. He knows everything about me. He knows me better than I know myself. He knew me, yet he loved me. And he still died for me. He went there for you. I, I was going to talk about it. I had a passage of scripture I was going to read with this to kind of give a little bit of a, to go along with this, but let me just throw this thought out there. <clears throat> he only died for you once. You know, I, I know people that struggle with their salvation and with, their, with assurance of their salvation. And I know that there's a doctrine out there that, you know, where people can, and I'm, I'm not going to go there, but this idea of, you know, is a question. I, I, I was, Friday I spoke at a, oh, I don't even know, what, it, was a, it was a breakfast, an area Christian thing. I think it's called ACTS, A-C-T-S, Area Christians Together in Service. So I was picking on them. It was a whole bunch of different denominations there, right? And so I said, how many, <clears throat> how many, how many, how many Baptists we have here? And a couple people kind of sheepishly raised their hands. Um, oh. there, was a past, there was a guy there that used to pastor this church back in the 70s. I can't think of his name. Uh, but he was there. Brain freeze. I'm looking at Bruce to help me, and he's not helping me at all. Uh, <laughs> yes! Okay, thank you. <laughs> pastor Westbrook was there. Um, <clears throat> so he was, he was the pastor when we put that part of the building on out here, right, in the 70s. He was, at least he told me that. <laughs> but there was a couple of Baptists there, and I said, how many Methodists we have here? And there was some more people that raised their hand. And I said, how many Wesleyans we have here? I said, that, and they were putting their hands up. I said, that wish you were Baptists. And, of course, that was, and they all, whoa, put their hands back down. <laughs> but... <laughs> But, you know, I forgot where I was going with that. Oh, but I know different, some different groups and everything. <laughs> different groups, they believe, you know, you lose your salvation or whatever. And, and the truth is, Jesus only had to die once. Jesus died once. And really, what he did for me really, really supersedes anything I could ever do for him. It's not about my grip on him. It's his grip on me. He went there for you. He went there for me. I'm going to read you something. I'm all done. Okay. Um, it's funny. Simple, simple thought. And I was kind of thinking, boy, this is, is this really what you want me to do? And then I came upon something or something actually was put up in my face on Facebook. And I read it and I'm like, holy cow, this is perfect. Um, the way it's worded here. Let me read it to you. 
I'm not familiar with the person that wrote this. I didn't even write down the author's name. And I'm not even sure it was something that was shared. I'm not even sure if this was the author. Every detail of this I don't agree with, but I agree with the premise, okay? It, here, I'll give you an example. Here's the first line. It says, he received 39 stripes because 40 was known to kill a man. Okay, we don't know for sure if that's how many. The tradition tells us that he got 39 stripes, but we don't know because the Jewish tradition was 39 stripes, but it wasn't the Jews that was whipping him. It was the Romans, and they had no such tradition. But I, I get it. But let me read it to you, and I'll shut up. Just read it. He received 39 stripes because 40 was known to kill a man. They wanted him alive. They held handfuls of his beard and hair and pulled it out by the roots. They wanted him alive. They kicked, punched, and spit on him for hours until there wasn't a spot on his body not covered in blood. But they wanted him alive. They shoved a crown of thorns down on his head so harshly it stuck in his skin. They wanted him alive. After hours of being beaten, mocked, whipped, flogged, and tortured, they made him walk with a cross. They made him carry it, a rough piece of wood with splinters digging into fresh wounds. They wanted him alive. They wanted him to feel every ounce of pain they could bring. He had to feel it in order to heal us. Crucifixion was historically one of the cruelest, most tortured deaths a human could face. Hours upon hours of torture. Torture most of us cannot mentally think of because the cruelty isn't normal. It isn't something our minds can comprehend. We celebrate Easter with pastel colors, happy children, hunting eggs, and chocolate. The truth is there was absolutely nothing happy about the day Jesus died. It was cruel, bloody, and nasty. He could have stopped it all. He could have called every angel in heaven to demolish every person standing and shouting, Crucify him. He didn't. He knew, he knew in order to have a Sunday, you have to have a Friday. He knew, he knew in order to have joy, you must carry your cross. He felt everything that day. He felt how your heart broke wide open when you had to watch your baby die. He felt how heavy your life was when you were staring down the barrel of a gun, wondering if the man you called husband was going to shoot you. He carried the weight of the burden you have, you have felt since your spouse died, and, and life just doesn't seem right since. On that cross, he held the rapist and murderers, the sinner and the saint. He leveled every playing field and said, all of you are worth it. He knew he had to carry the cross. He, he never promised the cross you carry in this life would not be heavy. His, his was. His promise is that Sunday is coming. No matter how heavy Friday is financially, emotionally, mentally, or physically, Friday is heavy. That cross is weighing you down and you're about to crumble under its weight. His promise was simply this. He won't make you carry it alone. What kind of king would step down from his throne for this? Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, did for you. He did every bit of it for you and me. Oh yes, it's heavy, so heavy, sometimes you don't think you can take one more step. But look up, because Sunday's coming. There's a song that you've heard me sing and you've heard Josh sing. It's called uh, Calvary is the Sea. And there's a line, there's a, this, I think it's the third verse that says, If I should ever doubt your love, my only prayer would be that you would keep your rugged cross etched upon my memory. He went there once. And it was like he went there just for you. Father, God, I pray, God, that you help us. Lord, if we can get nothing else out of this, Lord, the fact that you dearly and desperately love us. God, help us, Lord, to, to know how to return that love to you. Lord, where there's no way to put into words. No, we can't really thank you just doesn't seem like enough but God I pray that you just teach us Lord help us to thank you with our lives God help us help us help us I know one of the lies of the devil is that God doesn't care 
Lord, the truth is you cared deeply for us. With their heads bowed, a couple questions. I wonder if there's anybody here who said, you know what, pray for me. Maybe you've been a little discouraged, whatever it is. Maybe you've even, I don't know, it's easy for us to doubt, whatever it is. You say, you know what, Lord spoke to me in some way. Pray for me. Yes, 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 yes. Pray for me. Pray for me. Yes. Pray for me. One more question. Here's the question as plainly as I can put it. If you died today, let's, let's think about that for a second, okay? I know, it's, I know we don't like to go there, but let's just think about that for a second. What if you knew you were going to die today? This is it. This is your last day. Do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Do you know for sure? If you don't know, with nobody looking, I'm not doing this to embarrass anybody. If you don't know for sure, I think this is important enough to let's, let's, we need to talk about this. If you're, if you're, if you're not sure, I'm willing, if you'd be willing to just put your hand up, put it right back down, and in so doing, just asking for prayer, saying, you know what, pray for me. I got to be honest, I don't know. I'm not sure. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. Father, again, Lord, thank you for your goodness to us. God, I pray now that you'll bless these closing moments. In Jesus' name, amen.